Uh, this presentation explores our work as activists, architects and researchers, as members of Art and Arch Architecture Collective Public Works, working on the Rurban Poplar Project. Rurban is a research project between Public Works and AAA and explores urban and civ civic resilience, designing and initiating a series of eco-civic hubs which support alternative resilient modes of living in our cities. This talk focuses on mine and Hester's embedded research in Poplar, East London, and the Teviot Eco Civic Hub. The Poplar Hub has developed incrementally over the past four years as a form of situated activist practice, which engages the locality in the realities of our unfolding climate crisis and co produces bottom up responses to these challenges. The hub itself consists of a, of a series of prototype infrastructures testing a more resilient food system, improving air quality through green infrastructure, and supporting the potential for a more circular and reproductive economies within our city. Activist research emerged within the field of radical geography as a way of resourcing marginalized communities through the sharing of university wealth. It is an approach where researchers are most commonly embedded within the host community. We understand our work as activists in the sense that we are working from an embedded position within a community, trying to make material change in the Poplar neighborhood. By embracing Donna Haraway's partial perspective of place or the view from somewhere, we engage citizens within their lived reality, identifying issues of local importance and recognize the existing local capacities which can be nurtured for future change. Rather than adopting the role of service provider for locally engaged groups in the traditional sense of the architect, our activist approach adopts a form of situated design practice, which responds to, to localised problems and co-produces co solutions. The work of the architect goes beyond design and focuses on a relational design practice, which builds networks of support and knowledge. This knowledge is manifest in the prototype infrastructures developing on site, developing systems, objects and processes which address local needs. Within this situated form of practice, the architect encounters multiple different groups working between several communities of knowledge to define, develop and deliver projects. To better understand the relationship between these groups, we will consider how two case study projects at Rurban worked between a community of place and a community of concern. Understanding of both these communities is informed by Bruno Latour's actor network theory, using the network of human and non-human interactions to understand the situation. The community of concern that are often brought to Rurban through an idea we're exploring within a project with professional or personal interests within a field of knowledge. Informed by Latour's matters of concern, this community gathers around the dynamic process of understanding a condition, active in the production of knowledge within the changing site at Rurban. Their expertise rejects the static understanding of knowledge as a matter of fact, but instead is actively involved in developing new insight through their concern. The community of place describes the actors we met through the location of our work at Rurban. This community includes the human actors within the local community, such as residents from the estate, local schools and youth groups. As outlined by Latour's description of networks made up of social and material assemblages, community of place also considers the influence of the more than human we encountered as a result of being situated, such as the growing ecology of the site, the fabric of the post-war social housing estate we found ourselves within and the quality of the air in which this project takes place. In facilitating the collaboration between these groups, the arch architect translates ideas across different disciplines, reconfiguring and reimagining the knowledge gathered to engage, inspire, and inspire the different communities within the project. The prototyping of the moss wall at Rurban started with the problem or contradiction of setting up a community garden just off the A12 one of the most polluted roads in London. Having recently moved to Poplar from the Olympic Park, we applied for funding to run a programme of talks and workshops to discuss the poor air as a feature of the community of place we found ourselves within. Through a launch event, we invited a community of con concerned with air quality to a discursive dinner with talks from Friends of the Earth, the Green Party, members of the local housing association and residents from the estate. The meal was developed in response to our ignorance as architects about air quality and created a format for learning from a community concerned with improving it um, and a community who had lived and often grown up within the, this polluted air. 
It was through this discussion that we met with the sustainability department at the University of East London, who suggested the use of a moss wall, of, of moss within a wall to filter air as it passed into the community garden. We moved from passively observing the condition of poor air to actively exploring how we could improve it. This idea was developed through prototypes, de um, developed and built with a local primary school youth group and an architecture summer school. Designing and delivering workshops with this group became an opportunity to translate the expert knowledge from the University of East London into clear principles which structured the task of designing the wall. Building the prototypes was an empowering group activity as it provided the opportunity to consider how we could actively improve the conditions we found ourselves within. The wall as a built prototype became a concrete way to understand an abstract idea of air. The ongoing care for the prototype built a practice of care, returning to these abstract ideas through the physical object. The role of the activist architect was to synthesize the learning from the last workshop and feed it into the questions asked by the next design workshop. Through the translation of ideas between the community of concern and community of place, we were able to stay with the trouble of the project, to collectively understand a condition and a shared responsibility to improve it. The agency of the project to explain the condition of poor air, um, we did not present a solution developed out of our expertise knowledge, but instead together discussed what we did not yet understand. Two minutes to the end. In parallel with the Moss Wall, we've been working iteratively in prototyping a resilient food system in Poplar. Here, our role, of, role continues as co-learner in the process, working across multiple disciplinary and community boundaries to engage a diverse range of stakeholders in the co-production of a localized closed loop food system. Again, we mediate between scientific knowledge and knowledge rooted in place, acting as a facilitator of action and designing systems for a circular food system. Our role as activists can be understood in our initiation of the process, identifying acute local needs and assembling the diverse groups needed for the project's realisation. Similarly to the Moss Wall, the process began with a local problem, that being the lack of access to food waste recycling on the neighbouring estates. The Teviot is a mixture of low-rise flats and the local authority does not allow the collection of food waste to such properties. In addressing this sole issue, we identified the need for wider engagement with the whole food system, developing a circular infrastructure which addresses all stages of the food system. Residents expressed a keen interest in urban food growing, reflecting the desire to grow crops unavailable in the UK. The evolving prototype brings together grow local growing expertise, micro allotments, and combines it with composting and anaerobic digestion technology to create the system. Through a program of public workshops, we've engaged in a co-learning process between the community of place and our community of concern creating a space for mutual learning across groups, sharing knowledge of lived experience and how that interacts with the technical complexity of the food waste and recycling process. By focusing on creating an engaging process which brings together diverse stakeholders, we aim to, bring, aim to affect culture change from a dual perspective. Through participation in the project, we hope to affect local cultures within the community of place and realize the value of local food production. The project also aims to speak up to local authorities, the GLA and important strategic partners by demonstrating best practice for a lo localised circular food model, which can be replicated elsewhere by other communities. To finish, we would like to reflect on the multiple identities of the activist architect, which we encountered when develop these, developing these case studies. Architect as initiator worked strategically, highlighting important issues, fundraising to deliver the project. They develop a network around the project, speaking to strategic partners, such as councils, cultural institutions, and the housing association. Within Rurban, key to this form of init um, initiation is a negotiation of land, the space to act and test alternative ways of operating. Architect as, a, as facilitator worked across interdisciplinary groups, local residents, institutional and academic partners. They have the ability to speak across boundaries and translate knowledge, facilitating exchange to support mutual co-production. Architect as prototype designer engages in an iterative design method. It proactively engages a wider audience in an environmental issue through its production. This process relies on the translation of specialist knowledge of an abstract condition into design principles and a built element. It employs building as a process of collective learning and discovery from a place of ignorance, of not knowing, 
from the trouble we find ourselves within. And finally, architect assistant designer has an oversight of a process from start to finish, testing processes in practice and considering how we can achieve these ideas together. The architect and system designer works across scales, developing individual behavior change through the situated workshops, while also providing proof of concept for large scale institutional change. They support learning between the small scale action we carry out on site and the large scale implementation of these ideas at a neighborhood scale. Thank you. So this research conducted with the Critical Design Support SOS in August 2020, investigated the spatial tactics and theory of change behind Extinction Rebellion's protests. So finding flaws in their theory that I would argue have caused tactical mistakes, I then designed and implemented a campaign to spark debate within the movement. So in under two years, XR had grown from 15 founders to a movement of 200,000 members. And in the UK, after the April 2019 rebellion, climate awareness rose reaching record levels. So this rebellion in April 2019 demonstrated arguably what are XR's two main techniques, collective joy and mass arrest, the latter theorized by co-founder Roger Hallam. However, in October 2019, XR's popularity hit a low after what I'd argue is this, a misguided action at Canning Town Station here where they stopped the commuter train. Immediately, public opinion dropped. According to Hallam's theory, this was fine. You disrupt, arrest, and repeat until imprisonment follows. So Hallam sets out his strategy in common sense for the 21st century, advocating for the mass mobilization of the public in the capital city. Activists would need to break the law day after day to cause economic costs to the government. Successful mass actions, Hallam continues, must include mass disruption and mass sacrifice. His thinking is that when this public see the state repression of activists, they will join what he calls the universalist struggle. So his target is to bring 3.5% of the population out onto the streets in one space at one time, 2 million people. After one to two weeks of following this plan, he asserts, a regime is highly likely to collapse or enact structural change. So how can XR mobilize 2 million people when being criticized for being middle class, lacking diversity and exclusive tactics? Their defense is at best that they're using their privilege well in the tactic of mass arrest. At worst, Hallam advocates that inclusivity be limited to campaign spaces. Um, so ultimately, the implication is that people of color can organize in their own spaces, he says, but that means they can't participate in the main method of direct action. So my campaign, after all this investigation, aimed to spark debate within Extinction Rebellion by placing messaging in physical and digital spaces that XR activists visit. And at the time, XR were carrying out protests in central London. When carrying out actions with XR, we've recognized that generating an eye-catching image for the press and the public amplifies the impact of the protest. So for this, I wanted to target spaces where both the public and activists would pause um, and maybe take a photograph and read the material. And due to COVID restrictions, I chose the underground lines in London just as that's a protest. Online messaging was posted anonymous, anonymously in Excel's chat groups. So I, I identified the short term and medium terms of the campaign following the argument of Seth and Williams. The, convert, the campaign subverted the slogans and symbols of XR to provoke activists into reading the material. The pink fluffy handcuff motif and the pink pillow are designed to juxtapose the normal adverts on the underground and the XR campaign, campaign material and online chats. The overall style, which you can see on this presentation, followed a PowerPoint activism typology popular on Instagram at the time. So here you can see the uh, underground adverts and leaflets that I placed in the tube. So I received varying responses of support and indignation from activists, both online, online um, and was informed that the accompanying essay and critique was debated by XR UK's National Strategy Group. I haven't had any information on what they thought, but... It's so, two minutes to the end. Thanks. My question now is how architects might help shape activist practice. 
So in my own activist practice, I'm part of an Excel working group that designs protest architecture. So Nick Newman, who you can see on the top of the boxes on the left image, um, architect and member of the group, defines protest architecture as structures that facilitate direct action. So these leverage the laws that govern space and policing to extend the length of operations. And I see this project as a step towards expanding our practice of protest architecture. The architect and writer Leopold Lambert widens the definition of architecture to the organization of bodies in space. And for his activist practice, this helps highlight how laws and policy organize the public through architecture from streets to borders. Forensic architecture similarly have expanded the hybrid practice of architecture and activism, understanding sites not as fixed but shaped by social, political, and environmental forces. Um, so they gather evidence from space and situate it in the presentation in space and plug it back towards a particular audience from the courtroom to the public and activists. So this project follows the approach of critical spatial practice, particularly Marcus Mason's ideas for a political architect practice. He advocates for uninvited outsiders to intervene in disciplines or areas that benefit from exterior thinking. This is just my last idea. So how could architects go beyond the investigation and construction on behalf of activists to strategy and organization with them? The anarchist anthropologist David Graeber notes the importance of organization and explains his um, definition of direct action to include it. I would argue that movement strategy too is a structure that both facilitates and is direct action and organizes bodies in space. So what can we do as architectural students and workers experience the rigor working at multiple scales and timeframes through space and solving networks of problems add to activist practice. Thank you. Okay, so uh, good morning again, and uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity to present uh, uh, some of uh, some pieces of the work I'm uh, conducting uh, at the Department of Architecture and Arts of the U of University of Venice. And this morning, I would like to give some insight about the uh, project Global Tools, which uh, um, took place between 1973 and 1975, when uh, individuals and groups, part of the Italian radical design movement, gathered in a, in a group in this project, which was aimed to perform common workshops and seminars, conceived to be opportunities for collective exchanges within the movement. This opportunity was uh, uh, perceived by the member of the um, movement as necessary as uh, um, after the exhibition Italy, the New Domestic Landscape, which was held at MoMA in 1972, the radical design movement uh, uh, from Italy and its activities were, of course, uh, consecrated uh, worldwide, but at the same time, the uh, members of this movement felt uh, it was uh, um, this exhibition, this popularity was jeopardizing the radical potential of uh, uh, the activities of the movement. So uh, in uh, uh, 1973, they established uh, the uh, project, the group Global Tools, uh, in the headquarter of the magazine Casabella, as uh, uh, many of the members uh, were uh, uh, employed in the editorial staff of the magazine. And uh, from this uh, picture, which is the a cover of the Casabella issue announcing the founding and the establishment of uh, uh, the project Global Tools. We recognize uh, uh, many uh, major design groups from uh, Florence and Milan. So we recognize uh, uh, Archizoom and uh, uh, Super Studio and some individuals from uh, uh, Naples, Turin, Padova and Venice. This uh, uh, popular image uh, basically puts names on the faces. So we see that uh, gathered here are Andrea Branzi, uh, Ugo La Pietra, Adolfo Natalini, Cristiano Torado di Francia, Gianni Pettina, Alessandro Mendini, and uh, uh, many, many more. Obviously, Casabella becomes uh, the uh, main dissemination tool of the activities of the group, together with the, a series of uh, uh, self produced leaflets that the group calls uh, Bollettini, which uh, at the end they just uh, will uh, uh, involve two issues only. And we see here the covers of these two uh, leaflets produced by the group. Um, basically, the objective of uh, Global Tours was to hold a program of workshop and uh, um, seminars aimed to the propagation through experimental manual activities of an alternative approach to design and also to, uh, in general, to work, to uh, consumption, to technology based on individual creativity and based on the freedom from commercial and cultural structures 
and the stimulation of creative faculties of each individual, up to now suffocated by specialization and the craze for efficiency. In fact, uh, at the center of the activities of Global Tools uh, was a, a radical perspective on the coheval human condition in the industrialized society, which uh, condition made uh, harder to produce design that actually matter. And uh, one basic concept around which the activities of the group revolve is the um, non-intellectual man with his age-old innate wisdom and all the possibilities which may derive from this, even to the point of reverting to a nomadic way of life, destruction of the city, etc., etc. So uh, to conclude, uh, um, Global Tools experiences are relevant today for many reasons. First of all, for the uh, pedagogical model they present, even if it uh, was uh, um, all but a model, in fact, uh, um, in, in the same bulletin, Andrea Branzi calls their project a counter school or a non school or a school of non architecture in many, many ways. Anyway, their approach to learning and not uh, their approach to teaching is, uh, I think, is crucial today as uh, um, all, all of us, I mean, all the teaching, teaching professionals are. Uh, uh, really facing the need to adapt uh, uh, teaching patterns to conditions that are already changing. And then, of course, because the uh, topics and the attitudes that uh, uh, were the fulcrum of the activities and research of Global Tools are today shared by those, uh, um, those in, the in the practice that aims to integrate in their perspective ecosystemic views, uh, traditional construction techniques intended as uh, uh, local heritage, so to recover and not to, to lose, and uh, the employment of uh, local and renewable resources, self-production and communality. Francesca, two minutes to the end. Yes, I'm, uh, or I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm done, almost. And uh, uh, so to conclude once again, this, uh, uh, this radical approach basically is adopted by today by designers that uh, uh, engage also in uh, activist performances. So these two natures somehow go hand in hand. And to quote Brandy, this uh, designer that look for qualities in life other than those of the stale capitalistic well-being. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, this is some research I've been doing with Dave Roberts, whom we're going to co-present, but it's been looking at, I guess, the concept of radicality within exhibition spaces and particularly architectural exhibitions. And we're both architects and we're also, I guess, Marxists and interested in kind of theories of architecture. Um, so, sorry. Um, an archival photo from the Milan Triennale in 1968 shows a distant banner that when translated reads, the city is a machine, the speculator uses it, the architect designs it, and the worker builds it to be crushed. This slogan embodies the extraordinary way in which the 14th Milan Triennale became a notable flashpoint in a much wider socio-political moment that we still call 1968, in which the Triennale was occupied by an organised protest of students, mostly from architecture and artists, and an event which became to define the Triennale itself. In other words, the exhibition as both a space, an institution, and an ideology was for a time reorganized according to the radical energy of the street and the city. At the heart of this situation was a reaction against the anachronism of the Italian architectural education system and the growing disillusionment that the so-called economic miracle of Italy's post-war reconstruction effort had achieved only limited social sustainability in contrast to the accelerating inequalities of the expanding contemporary city. A later photo after the student occupation of the Triennale shows the entry to the event forlorn and covered in graffiti with a simple phrase scrawled on the walls, the Triennale a morta, the Triennale is dead. 1968 was a period of obvious mobilization, embodying a collective social energy of both optimism and pessimism across Europe, and which spurned a reappraisal in Marxist theory, as well as an academic interest in activism and protest across multiple disciplines. Coinciding with the dramatic decade of political awareness and social justice, the role of the exhibition and the creative institution that housed it was interrogated for what were perceived to be the political prejudices and privileges they represented. In Western Europe and America, the traditional gallery and exhibition embodied the 19th century bourgeois ideals of patronage and privilege and was easily positioned as, an out, of touch, as out of touch with the contemporary currents of a young, disenfranchised and socially aware urban population that was asking for greater representation from its creative institutions and a more inclusive political agenda. 
Within this, though, a counter narrative emerged, which not only radicalized the exhibition as a mode of critical engagement, but implemented it as a strategy from within that could disrupt the hegemonies of both capital and class. Um, however, in Italy, this movement was preceded by an earlier radical renewal of the country's museums after the war and two decades in which its artistic heritage was weaponized under fascism. Arda Pavera, as named by the Italian critic Germana Cialate, was a formidable neo-avant-garde phenomenon that embodied the collective Italian frustration with the institution, as well as its mobilization through radical engagement and critique. Similarly in architecture, the gallery and the exhibition offered a mode of critique throughout the 60s to challenge the orthodoxies of the institution and the profession, as well as the dialectical positions of both class and culture. The Triennale, which was a definitive moment in the work of its curator, the Italian radical architect Giancarlo Di Carlo, was characterized by the radical externalization of the exhibition itself, which sought to dismantle the enclosure of the cultural institution and reorient its message to the city and the street as a place of cultural production and political agency. Giancarlo Di Carlo had used the exhibition throughout his career as a mode of both architectural and political practice. His work had actively encouraged participation at a number of levels and also promoted vernacular forms of industrial architecture with an explicit advocacy of the rights of, work, of workers. In the Triennale, this notion of participation was both politicized and radicalized. Titling the exhibition, The Large Number, De Carlo sought to address the great transformation phenomena currently occurring within contemporary society. One of the exhibits within the exhibition space represented a typical street scene of the 1968 student riots. For De Carlo, absorbing the energies of mass politics was an essential task of the political architect, whereas for contemporaneous writers such as Baudrillard, mass culture is portrayed as an entirely negative energy that destroys an older bourgeois culture. Other scholars such as Nicolin have argued that the various forms of speculation that occurred during the occupation of the Triennale could be regarded as new and productive forms of radical architectural practice in their own right and that the failure of the exhibition was a success from the standpoint of architectural history. The efficacy of this moment is offset by the formidable and contemporaneous position of Manfredo Tafuri, who occupies a significant and problematic voice in architectural history and theory of the 20th century, which we don't quite have time to go into fully. What is significant in Tafuri's critique is his insistence on the inefficacy of the neo-avant-garde projects in architecture that purport to be and are frequently associated with radicality. Mounting a dialectical critique of contemporary architecture in the Italian context from its foundations, Tafuri effectively questions the basis of architectural practice in all its forms in a way that is proven to be both enduring and formidable to future scholarly attempts to link Marxism and architectural discourse. The scholarly academic position of Tafuri and the grounded and participatory position of De Carlo both represent substantial and sustained critiques of modernism and capitalism, but with deeper ideological foundations of radicality, which influenced a generation of institutional activism in Italy throughout the 1970s. This concluded with the effective institutionalization of radicality in the Venice Biennale as a commodified incubator of experimentation, but within clearly defined, gentrified, and often institutional boundaries. Two minutes to the end. Okay. So what is the significance of the 14th Milan Triennale 1968 to the contemporary Italian Biennale or Triennale? Perhaps this answer is actually tied up with the idea of sustainability. The upcoming 23rd Milan Triennale in 2022 is titled Unknown Unknowns, What We Don't Know, We Don't Know, which is an extension of the theme of the 22nd Triennale, Broken Nature Design Takes on Human Survival. Both allude to some reconnection with both the social and environmental agency of the exhibition as a mode of radicality and participation. Recent Venice architecture biennales are somewhat more generalized but point at social, political and economic issues that architecture must address. This suggests a shift towards an acknowledgement of the Anthropocene on the one hand and unsustainable economic and social systems on the other, both of which are symptoms of crises that obsessively took place outside of the exhibition space. The large number of 1968 concerned crises regarding the social function of the exhibition environment and its future role in radical action that were central to the 1960s and still present today. Equally, it marks the taming of radicality in the exhibition space as is institutionalized and appropriated by the forms of cultural production it sets out to challenge. 
This was a claim made against the avant-garde in, similar, in a similar period by Peter Berger, and it's still relevant, particularly in a discussion around radicality. Within this, we find the emergence of a new potential mode of both radicality and conservatism in the ambiguous figure of the curator, who connects ideologies with new modes of participation and engagement in both the institution and the gallery itself. As Frederick Jameson has recently suggested, there is a shift at play in the avant-garde modes of cultural production throughout recent history, to quote, the avant-garde in our time has been replaced by another kind of figure. We might isolate from these practices of the new kind of museum, the emblematic figure of the curator, or to paraphrase Marx, curators have become, uh, sorry, curators have hitherto only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. Thank you very much. <laughs>